Why did God make us in his own image? And what does that even mean anyway? Well, welcome to the Faith in a Busy World podcast with me, Steve Griffiths. Being made in the image of God is a phrase that trips off the tongue so easily, doesn't it? And uh, we all know the verse that uh, we're referring to primarily from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, which says this, So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We know the verse, but uh, what does that actually mean? And in what sense are we created in the image of God? Um, it can't be physically. We're assuming that God doesn't have two arms and two legs and a head and ears and eyes, you know. So, in one sense, we're not expecting it to be a physical representation. But um, if it's not that, what is it? Well, in this session, we are going to be thinking about why we were created by God in the first place. And that really gives us a way into thinking about what it means for us to be made in the image of God. It gives us a sense of the purpose of it for us. And then once we've worked out what the purpose of being made in the image of God is actually for, then we can think about how it actually works in us. So why were we created in the image of God in the first place? Well, fundamentally, it's a really easy question to answer. The reason we were made in the image of God was so that we could enjoy a relationship with him. It's as simple and straightforward as that. You may have heard of the Westminster Catechism, which is a document that was written in the 1660s. Um, and uh, it sums up the Christian faith, if you like. It was a document that was put together in order for people to learn what the basics of the Christian faith were all about. And it was set out in a question and answer style. And um, the very first question um, says this. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Did I say that was written in the 1660s? I meant the 1640s. 1646 to 47. So what is the chief end of man? The word end there means goal, if you like, the uh, thing towards which we're traveling, the aim of life. Well, man's chief goal is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Sorry about the gender language. It was written in the 1640s. That's the way it was back then. But of course, we're really talking about uh, male and female, of course. So the notion that we are aiming towards something, this end, this goal, is um, based on something called Aristotelian teleology, which sounds pretty darn philosophical, does it not? Well, Aristotle was a Greek philosopher in the 4th century BC, and a lot of our understanding of how we interpret scripture, how we interpret the Bible, is based on uh, the um, worldview of Aristotle. And that is not least the case when it comes to understanding what it means for us to be made in the image of God. And he had this idea, as I say, called Aristotelian teleology. Uh, teleology comes from the Greek word telos, which means end or aim. And it's called Aristotelian because it was developed by um, Aristotle, of course. And the idea of um, Aristotelian teleology is this. Aristotle was asking the question, what is the one thing that human beings aim for just for its own sake? Because quite often we do things for a greater aim, don't we? So, for example, uh, you might take a course of study in order to get a promotion or in order to do a particular job. Uh, you might take up um, learning a language in order to be able to speak that language when you go on holiday or when you interact with people from that um, uh, language group um, in your um, work life or social life or whatever. So a lot of what we do, we do in order to achieve something else. Aristotle was asking the question, is there anything that we do just for its own sake and not for anything further on than that. And he said, yes, there is. When you break it all down, there is one thing that we do, which is to pursue happiness. And uh, I'm going to give you quite a long quote from Aristotle here, uh, but this is what he said about that. Uh, he said, now, 
If there is an end which we seek for its own sake and which is the cause of our seeking all the other ends, it is clear that this must be the absolute good. Now, happiness, more than anything else, appears to be just such an end, for we always choose it for its own sake and never for the sake of something other, for the sake of some other thing. Nobody chooses happiness as a means of achieving anything else whatsoever than just happiness. Happiness, then, is the end to which all our conscious acts are directed, is found to be something final and self sufficient. Now, that's a pretty big quote for us to think about. Um, but basically, what Aristotle is saying is that happiness is something we pursue just for the sake of happiness. It's not an end to something else. And that fundamentally, all the choices we make in life, all the decisions we make in life are for the pursuit of happiness. Whether they are good decisions or whether they are bad decisions. So, for example, I might choose to um, go to church worship on a Sunday morning because I know that the worship of God is the ultimate thing for me to do in life, and that will make me happy. Conversely, I might decide that um, I'm going to steal your car because stealing your car means that I will then have the car that I wanted, and that's going to make me happy. Do you see? So good choices and bad choices are all the pursuit of happiness. And so, as Aristotle says here, we choose happiness for its own sake, not for the sake of anything else. Now, sometimes the decisions we make in life, you might say, well, they don't make me happy. Um, but Aristotle would argue that most of those choices you make because they will lead eventually to happiness. So, for example, if you were doing a course of study at college, the thought of writing essays or taking exams isn't going to make you happy. But you know that by passing your essays, passing your exams, that will then bring you happiness at a later date. So even they are a delayed form of pursuit of happiness. Does that make sense? So um, for Aristotle, then, happiness is what it is all about. And all of our conscious efforts and acts are directed to the pursuit of happiness for good and for bad. Now, what's this got to do with being made in the image of God, you may well ask yourself. Well, the answer is this, that as Christians, we believe that our ultimate happiness is living in a relationship with God, that there is nothing that could bring us more happiness, more joy, more peace than living in a relationship with God. And so God has made you and me in such a way that we can achieve that. He has made us in such a way that we can find ultimate happiness through a relationship with him. So all of our choices in life then are designed to move us towards that goal of um, enjoying a relationship with God. Now, there was a uh, theologian in the 17th century in the UK uh, called William Benn. And um, William Benn wrote a book called Soul Prosperity. And in that book, he said this. He said, remember then that the ruling, predominant, chief and principal end, the aim, in laboring for the things of this world should be in reference to the world to come. So in laboring after all the things of this life, we should desire them not as stops, but as steps in the way to heaven. Isn't that clever? What um, William Ben was saying there was that everything that we do, every decision we make in life should be decided in the light of the second coming, should be decided in the light of the fact that um, that, 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 that we are pursuing happiness and eternal life with God. So we are constantly living in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. That's the idea that uh, he is, is, is getting across there. So when we live holy lives, when we set our 
when we realize that God has set us apart uh, for himself and has set us apart to live our lives in such a way that it's honoring and obedient to him, then we are being true to ourselves. That is who we are. We are holy, set apart people created in order to live in a loving and obedient relationship with him. So when we choose for God, when we choose for the happiness of living in a relationship with God, then we are being who we were created to be. We are fulfilling our destiny. So holiness then is our destiny to be set apart by God for God is our destiny. It is our beginning. It's what we were created for. And it is our end. It is what we are aiming for. So here we can now begin to get a definition of what it means to be made in the image of God, which is this. To be made in the image of God means to participate in holiness and to find our ultimate happiness in that. So we were created in God's image. And as we participate in holiness, as we choose for God, as we make decisions for God in our everyday life, as we choose to obey God, as we choose to live out a life of holiness and discipleship, we know that we are going to find our ultimate happiness in that. Now we come on to the idea of, well, how are we going to describe it? How do we describe this notion of being made in the image of God? Um, well, that's quite deep philosophy. <laughs> and we're going to get into a bit of deep philosophy now. So uh, I hope that's okay for you. But to do it and to think about this idea in more depth, we're going to be thinking about uh, the writings of an early church father called St. Augustine uh, from the fourth century. He was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. And he wrote two books primarily exploring this issue. The first was called The City of God. And the second was called On the Trinity. And in these books, he uh, was in part exploring, well, what does it mean for us then to be made in the image of God? And he took as his starting point the belief that God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so his argument was, well, if there, if God is a Trinity and we are made in the image of God, there must be a Trinity within us that enables us to pursue happiness. You with me? I hope so. And if there is a trinity within us that enables us to pursue happiness and our ultimate end of a relationship with God, then what is that trinity? And in his book on the trinity, he explored lots of different options about that, what that trinity uh, might look like. But in the end, he came up with the idea that there is a trinity in our minds. And it was important that it's in our minds because it is through our minds that we communicate with God. The mind of God and the mind of man communicate, as it were, with each other. So to find a trinity within the human mind is fundamentally what it means for us to be uh, made in the image of God. So what was this trinity then that Augustine said was in the human mind? Well, it is this, that in the human mind, firstly, there is memory, how we remember things. Um, secondly, there is understanding how we comprehend information that we receive. And then thirdly in the mind, there is the idea of will, which is how we are going to respond to that information. So, for example, I remember that on Sunday morning, I've got to go and lead my congregation in worship in the church where I am the priest. That's my memory reminding me that I've got to do that. The understanding how I comprehend that information is, oh my goodness, I'm going to need to write a sermon and uh, choose the hymns and the songs to sing for that, and I haven't got around to doing it yet. And then in the will, I say, 
okay, this afternoon I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write the sermon and I'm going to choose the hymns for Sunday. So this is the memory, the understanding and the will all working together. Um, but what is important for uh, Augustine's purposes is this. He writes this in his book on the Trinity. He says, these three, memory, understanding and will, are independent but in interrelated. So he says, these three then are not three lives, but one life, one in that they are one life, one mind, one being, but they are three in that they have reference to each other. Now that's important, of course, for Augustine, because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are independent of one another, but they are interrelated. They are not three lives, but one life, God. Um, they are three in that they have reference to each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is the Trinity at work in the mind, the memory, the understanding, and the will, all three of those are independent, but interrelated. And so that mirrors the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's how Augustine approaches what it means for us to be made in the image of God, that there is a trinity in the mind. Now, that being the case, Augustine then goes on to say, well, there's actually two primary activities that the mind undertakes, that when we uh, think about what is what is the mind for, the human mind, what do we do with it, that there are fundamentally two activities. And uh, he describes them as this. He says that the mind firstly is involved in the search for knowledge, and secondly, the mind is involved in the search for wisdom. Now, what's the difference there? The search for knowledge, according to Augustine, is the idea that we are constantly trying to understand the world. So through physics and biology and history and geography and social sciences, uh, we are constantly trying to comprehend how the world works the cosmos in which we live, how car engines run, how much sugar we need to put on our uh, cereals in the morning, construction of DNA, whatever it is, knowledge is something that the mind pursues. And that is the understanding of the world. But there is also this other activity that we undertake in the mind, which is the search for wisdom. And Augustine says that the wisdom is not a sort of product that exists in the world. It's something that transcends the nature of the world. So the pursuit of wisdom would be searching for things like an understanding of God or um, love or courage or the ability to know what to do with the knowledge that we have. Do you see? So wisdom is much more kind of conceptual and abstract, and it exists out there rather than in here in the cosmos of our world. And so Augustine uh, says then that it's a kind of layered thing, that the mind pursues knowledge which is our understanding of the created order. And then the mind sort of moves beyond itself, because don't forget the mind is part of the created order, right? The mind is made up of uh, material. So the mind is part of the created world, the cosmos, and can be understood through neuroscience and physics and chemistry and biology and so on and so forth. Um, so when the mind pursues wisdom, it is journeying beyond itself. It's stepping beyond itself to understand things that are beyond the created order, like love and courage and beauty and so on and so forth. And then once we're journeying beyond ourselves, then we journey even further to the ultimate happiness, the ultimate knowledge, the ultimate wisdom, which is being in a relationship with God and knowing god so you see there's a there's a there's a there's a journey going on there from knowledge 
to wisdom, to knowing God. And in order to achieve that, the mind needs to constantly be transcending itself and journeying upwards. So that being the case, Augustine uh, then says, this trinity is found in one quite simply undivided mind, but only in that part which is concerned with the contemplation of eternal things can one find something that is not only a trinity, but also the image of God. So he's saying that it is when the mind transcends itself and goes beyond itself and begins to contemplate eternal things like grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and atonement and all that kind of stuff and begins to engage with it, that is where the image of God is found in human in humanity. Does that make sense? So um, he's locating the image of God in the understanding and the interaction with transcendent things that are going on in uh, beyond the mind. So what that then fundamentally means is that the mind, the human mind, is constantly being drawn away from itself and journeying upwards. The mind is seeking wisdom. The mind is seeking the things of God. The mind is being drawn towards God in love. So here then becomes the interesting fact that being made in the image of God is not a static idea. It's not like God is uh, has got two arms and two legs and two ears and has got eyes and hair, you know, and it's kind of like some static thing. We are made in that image. What it means for us to be made in the image of God is that it is a dynamic principle. We are constantly growing into the image of God. The more we transcend ourselves, the more we pursue wisdom, the more we pursue God, we grow into his image because that's where the image of God is found. It's found on the journey towards ultimate happiness. So fundamentally then, being made in the image of God is a dynamic principle. It is a movement of love. Whenever I reach out beyond myself to help somebody who is homeless or who is hurting or is sad or upset. Whenever I move out beyond myself into an act of worship and prayer and meditation and reflection on the glory of God, then I'm reaching out beyond myself to this eternal being who is God. And so to be made in the image of God fundamentally is about leaving ourselves behind and pursuing other people in love, pursuing God in love. And as Augustine reminds us, that is fundamentally uh, what the Trinity, God as Trinity, is all about. The Father loving the Son who loves the Spirit, and the Spirit who loves the Son who loves the Father, and the Son who loves the Father and the Spirit. They, they, they're constantly looking beyond themselves and loving one another and existing in a relationship of love. So if you want to be the image of God, if you want to grow in the image of God, then you need to understand that it's a process. It's not something that just is. It's a process. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of loving others, looking beyond yourself looking beyond your own mind and engaging with others in love. It's a lifestyle of holiness as we increasingly become set apart by God for the purposes of God. It's a lifestyle of sacrifice, putting our own needs and our own desires and our own wants um, to one side or as less important than meeting the needs of other people. It's a lifestyle of living in um, obedient discipleship to God and following his word and doing what we can to worship him and to love him and to honor him and to reflect him in the world. Being made in the image of God fundamentally 
is the life of discipleship. And that is our ultimate happiness. We know that we will only be ultimately happy when we are being faithful to Jesus and being faithful disciples of him. So then, um, we become the image of God through love. That's the important thing, that it's not a static idea. It's not something you just are. You become the image of God increasingly as you learn to love others and you learn to love God and you learn to put your own ego as a less important thing than that. And as you pursue eternal things, as you pursue um, love and courage and beauty and wisdom, so you will become stronger as a disciple and you will continually grow in the image of God. So fundamentally then, um, it all comes back to uh, Luke chapter 10, 27. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, fundamentally, it's all about love. <laughs> we knew that anyway, right? The Christian faith is all about loving God and loving our neighbor. But if you want to grow in the image of God, it's all about love. You've got to love other people. You've got to love God and you've got to um, sort of um, die to self as you pursue love and you pursue beauty in uh, other people. So uh, it's all about love. So will you pursue the image of God through love? What can you do today in order to love others more? What can you do today in order to love God and to draw closer to him through worship and prayer and discipleship? If you can find ways to love, 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 then you will continually grow in the image of God. Well, I hope that's been helpful, uh, a little bit philosophical and um, perhaps a little bit uh, deep, but um, a really, really important topic. If you have found it useful, then please do uh, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and uh, thank you for being with me today. And I look forward to being with you again very soon. Bye-bye. <music>